So I've prepared to talk to you guys a bit about day one, but uh, more than just what the app is, like how it came to be and my interactions with Apple and and um, a lot of the common questions you probably have about it. Um, uh, I, I, I'm a computer fanatic, but I'm more of like a, uh, people ask me, do you write code, are you a programmer? I say more of a hobbyist, I like, I've done flash programming and I was way into action script, but, um, and I enjoy the technical side of, of creating software, but my talent is in design and in interface design, and that's what I really love. Um, so and feel free to interject and ask questions as I'm going, as, as, as things come up that may interest you, if you want me to go deeper on. Um, but a quick background about myself, just I, I mentioned like graphic design, I went to the U University of Utah, which we focused on just core design um, elements like typography and color. And, uh, and then I self-taught myself HTML, CSS, and Flash, and um, really enjoyed the combination of the two. So I worked for an ad agency, I worked for a startup in Utah County, Move Networks, for three years um, with a ton of insanely talented engineers. Where, and that's where I realized, you know, I have no business in programming, but um, I, and I should focus on the UI design uh, for my career and work closely with talented engineers. And so when that thing kind of crashed down, I was laid off uh, unexpectedly and had decided, I came home and told my wife, uh, I'm just, I'm not going to find another job. I'm going to find clients and do my own thing for, you know, as long as I can. And that worked out great, except for, I, I had plenty of work, but it was just too much to manage and like not enough focus. I didn't really like dealing with lots of clients. And so, um, yeah, my goal always was to try and find time or make more time to work on my own passion projects, like we all have, but to do so more in the daytime and regular hours, not just at night. And in 2011, I launched day one. So um, currently day one is, uh, it's been about two and a half years since I launched it. And now we have six full-time employees. Uh, four of those are developers, um, myself, the designer, and a manager. It's self-funded and still profitable. Um, <clears throat> let's see. So it's a it's on the Mac App Store for nine ninety nine, iOS for four ninety nine. Looks a little bit like this if you haven't seen it. It's a journal app. It's just a clean interface uh, focused on writing. Uh, has you can add a single photo to each entry. It keeps the timeline of everything's date based. Calendar view syncs with um, iOS to Mac. Um, and it's just, for my personal use, like it, I love it to just like jot down like where I was at and who I was with and details about um, certain events or just thoughts or ideas. And, uh, and this gives me an outlet to put those things down in a private way. This is what the current app looks like on iOS, and we're close to launching an iOS 7 update, which looks more like this. So that's day one. Um, so I, it's, I started out with this idea, this, this big idea of building this grand tracking app, because I loved the idea of like tracking um, data and producing beautiful like visualizations. But in the end, I really wanted to create a journal app. And so I, like, I tried to find friends of mine that were engineers to partner with me on it. And uh, couldn't really sell anyone on the idea. And uh, so about, a, about six months into when I was doing freelance work on my own, I partnered with one guy, not on the journal, but on a, just a really simple iPad app game. And uh, I designed it. He built it. And it was a, a mild success, like um, it was featured in the App Store 
and sales were awesome for the first month or two, and then it kind of just took a nosedive. And uh, I learned a lot. It wasn't something that I wanted to like do long term, but I just wanted to get into the iOS and the App Store. And um, specifically, I wanted to find client work that was doing iOS design. So I had to have something to show for it. So I built this this game. And uh, it was a memory match game for, for kids, really. Um, but I learned a lot of things when I did that. One, I did not want to get into game development because it was like very competitive against some bigger companies that do uh, outstanding games. Not to say that you can't compete still, but um, I really like productivity type apps. Um, and I also realized that I had a hard time trying to negotiate every feature about the product with my partner and felt like that was kind of distracting and hold, holding me back. So I decided the next thing I'm going to do, I'm going to save my money until I'm able to just pay somebody to build it the way I want it. And uh, so I, um, actually I'll go back. So I <clears throat> worked for one year doing client work and I told my clients in December, I'm taking the whole month off and I'm just going to focus on this so I can do it during the day and when I want to. And that's when I focused on just creating a simple journal application. Um, it was something that I personally really wanted. I needed a way to enter time-based text entries. I just kind of wanted like a developer's log, just this is what I did. And kind of influenced by Twitter too, some social media things where um, this concept of microblogging and just status updates. I liked doing the same sort of idea, but in a private manner. And so that's, that's, that was really an inspiration for what day one became. Um, so before that, like I had tried all the journal apps and nothing really fit with my personal need. I used things for reminders. So I would set a daily reminder to remind me to write in my journal with a message in there about just reminding me to keep it simple, just to put something down. And then I would, I could email myself entries when I was on my phone or away from my computer and then just keep them logged in like pages app. Eventually I started using Mac journal, which I felt was really bloated, didn't have sync. And, uh, and so that's sort of where um, I, a lot of the initial core features of day one, which were reminders, uh, quick entry through the menu bar, just to jot down like you're on a phone call with somebody, and just kept it really clean UI-wise, and inspirational messages, and sync. I, I think the number one key to the, the long-term success that day one has had has been sync, and uh, I can't take full credit for that. Um, luckily, the guy that I hired to build the Mac app, Ben Dolman, was working at, at uh, Mosey at the time, who d deals with like data backup and conflict resolution stuff. And he architected the data model for day one at, in a brilliant way that was able to sync right off the bat using Dropbox. Um, and he built the Mac app for me. And Mac dev is hard, and coming from web design, like I didn't realize, and from Flash development, I didn't realize how hard it was to like do custom user interface. I'm used to being able to customize anything, so when I sent the designs over to Ben, um, he saw it more as a challenge and took it on and was able to implement my designs, which really made it stand out from everything else that's in the Mac app store, which typically used pretty heavily like the native Chrome which isn't bad, but um, it def they definitely don't stand out as much. Um, the number two key to the success was the low overhead and scale for operation. So I could scale the app and I didn't have to deal with operations. And by relying on Dropbox to handle all the cloud-based storage, I was able to scale an app as a one-man team with contractors to an unlimited user base with no overhead of operations management, which was, you know, unheard of until that time. Uh, 
that was really impossible. And uh, so Dropbox, the timing of what Dropbox could do and people's uh, be accepting Dropbox, a lot of users already had accounts with it. Uh, it was ideal for the situation and has worked out really well. Um, ideally, that's what iCloud is for as well. So this was pre-iCloud, and I'll come back to that. So the Apple announced the Mac App Store on October 20th, 2010, and um, I had, I was an iPhone user. I actually switched to the Mac only a few years earlier. Um, I, I was into Windows because I did a lot of flash development and it, I felt like it was a faster, um, a faster system. Uh, and so I'd witnessed a lot of people like hit that, what they called the gold rush in the iOS app store, which is like being the first on the app store, not a lot of competition. Um, so my first thing was I, I want to build this product. It can be very simple. I just really want these text-based entries. And when they announced the app, the Mac app store, I, I was like, that's it. Like, I don't care how, how good it is. I'm going to get an app on the Mac app store and, uh, and we'll just see how it goes. And, you know, at the very least, it's something that I'll use. Uh, so we aimed for that. The, the app store launched on January 6, 2011. We missed it by two months. It took three months to build 1.0 and launched on March 9th, 2011. And uh, right when I had submitted that app to, well, actually, right when I created the project in um, iTunes Connect and submitted screenshots of it, immediate, and I had no relationship with Apple, like they had no idea who I was or anything, immediately I got an email from them asking for um, uh, art for potentially featuring the app, which I did receive when I did that game too, so I knew well, it could or could happen couldn't happen, but like that's a good sign. They hadn't even seen the app other than just these screenshots. Um, and then sure enough, when I launched it, they gave me what I consider the best spot in the App Store. It's, it's not the, the top feature banner, it's the first item in the new and noteworthy. Um, and so that was a good day. Like, and then first, like all the stars uh, ratings were five star, like, off to a great start. Um, and looking back at it, like now I would be embarrassed to launch what the app was then. Um, but, you know, people didn't care. Like uh, it's, it did, but the, the first like one star review started coming in and they were like, how do you launch a journal app with no password protection? And uh, I was like, you know, you can password protect your computer if you want, you know. So it, that wasn't something that was going to hold me back, but I, and I and I put it out there at ten dollars, which the apps, the iOS app store had already driven the app model uh, or the app pricing thing kind of down to where people were racing to the bottom for prices to ninety nine cents. So a ten dollar app was was pretty high, and uh, but I put it out there and I I said in the to app description, look, this is the first version. I plan on maintaining and updating this for several years, and I will be adding these features. Unfortunately, I included encryption in one of those descriptions. I followed through on the promise to, to add all those features other than encryption, which is a whole other story. Um, so, sales were great. It's you know, here's the screenshot of it, the number 11 top paid apps. It's been as high as number four. Um, the second week, it was what is now the editor's choice where it's that top banner. And this was, this was you know, I've, it's been given like app of the year and this and that, but like this was probably the greatest moment, I don't know, of my life, but like it was the best moment because it was like this is actually something that is going to sustain that people are connecting with and like, Apple digs it, um, like there, this could be more. And I had already gone back to doing my client work at this time um, because, you know, my, my game app I'd seen just kind of take a nosedive and I kind of expected this to do the same, but was hopeful that it didn't. And, uh, so, but I was still just taking it, being cautious, 
um, to see how it would level out once it wasn't featured anymore. <clears throat> so with the, the Mac App Store, like I'd heard from other app, like Mac app devs who um, had apps and they, they kind of frowned upon the idea of giving up 30% to Apple when you know they'd been keeping the entire portion selling it themselves. But in my opinion, it's a great deal because, um, well, obviously because it's featured, but um, there's no way I could have released the app just being a one-man team and done like the payment processing, which now is a little easier with Stripe and such stuff, licenses, trials, like and um, promoting the app, that kind of stuff. Apple just kind of takes care. I've never done any marketing or promotion. Um, so, oh yeah, that was a different slide. There you go. So a big part of it is the people love it. It's not just the Apple the guys love it and it gets featured. It's really heavily comes down to, I think, like the ratings that you get. Uh, and those have always, you know, there's, there's always the people that hate it and, or don't, or dislike it or, but it can, a lot of people connected with it. Um, comments like, now I just need to buy a Mac so I can buy the Mac version too. I'm sure Apple likes that. So, yeah, like a lot of tech people picked up on it too because like I used, it was, um, it's more accessible to people. Like we, we launched with the command line interface. Every, all the data is stored in text files, XML based, so people can parse through it themselves. Um, so, and it uses Markdown to, to render in the interface, it's all plain text. Um, so a lot of tech people connected with it. Um, Federico at Mac Stories loves it. Um, we got a Life Hacker article. The Verge, that one was solicited. A lot, of, a lot of the coverage was unsolicited, but I actually just hit up, a, I saw um, Ellis Hamburger at The Verge did a review of Instapaper or something. So I just emailed him and say, hey, have you seen day one? Um, I liked your interview or your review there and he hadn't seen it, tried it out and he's one of the biggest fans now and uh, so that doesn't hurt. He interviewed me on The Verge. Let's see, tons of YouTube videos, users submitted, just um, reviews and stuff. And uh, I mentioned the command line interface in XML like uh, Brett Terpstra created this open source project called Slogger, which allows you to connect a third party um, social media and stuff and import your data into day one. Um, like, I think a lot of people also understood and appreciated the value of owning their data. They're so used to like their data being on Facebook or Flickr or other sites where it was all kind of stored in Dropbox so they could see the files on their computer. Um, you know, at least the tech people kind of connected with that idea too. When we hired BJ, his wife made a cake. <laughs> um, so uh, the fact is I'm not a salesman at all. Like I, I, I can't sell day one. So um, I, I really like the app store that can, and, and the idea of just creating a product that sells itself. Um, yeah, like I'll, I'll I was on the bus once at a concert and like I was explaining to this girl next to me what day one was and this lady next to her was like pulling it up on her phone. She's like, is this it? I'm gonna buy it. And I was like, don't buy it. Just cause I'm sitting here, please. And, and the girl's like, you are the worst salesman I've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it's, it's sold over 600,000 apps like uh, with Mac and iOS combined, um, which is, is been awesome. So, how do you how do you get Apple to notice and feature your app? Um, I've never like approached them about any sort of features. Like I said, you know, it was just a nice surprise when when you see it on there. I don't know that you can do that. Um, I just think focus on the design, the interface, user the custom UI kind of sort of stands out. Something that's different, which is 
I think also revisited now with iOS 7, a lot of apps look very similar now because everybody's like, oh, iOS 7's new, let's just use that, myself included, because it looks cool, but eventually all the apps are kind of going to look the same. Um, so being able to stand out a bit, the user experience, like keeping that simple and focused. Like when you open day one on the iOS, it's just like there's a big plus. Now there's a camera too because you had a photo, but it was originally just the big plus. You hit that and it creates an entry. Um, so I don't think there's any tricks or any inside knowledge or anything. It's just about a quality product. So um, you can do things, and, uh, and I have done things kind of um, just naturally because I'm a tech guy, like I'm always, and all of you guys are too, you watch WWDC and all the Apple announcements and, and you see the new features that they're, they're hinting, you know, that slide that has all the, uh, the words for the features that are coming, some they've talked about, some that's just a hint of something that's coming in the ne next operating system update. Um, when I hired Adam Kirk, um, he's a developer for uh, Calvetica. He's like, oh, when we were interviewing him, he's like, I know what you guys do. You just, you just see whatever feature Apple's are promoting like in their next operating system and you just add that to your app and then you get promoted. And I was like, that was the first time I really thought about it. And I was like, well, kind of do that. We have, I definitely did that with the Mac App Store launch. Like I knew the App Store was gonna come and Apple's gonna promote the heck out of it because um, that's the thing moving forward. So I targeted that. And the same thing when Apple announced iCloud, I said to my guys like above and beyond anything else we're doing, like I wanna get iCloud sync in there because Dropbox is great, but iCloud is enabled by default and like people will be syncing without even knowing it, which is kind of magical. They just, they've been using the Mac app and then they buy an iPhone, buy the app, open it up and their data is just in there. Um, it wasn't that simple. Uh, <laughs> iCloud was, so I, I did that. I was like, we're gonna make it happen. And Rod knows, Rod helped me out a little bit on it. We, it was the hardest thing by far that we've ever done on day one to, was to get iCloud sync to work. Um, and we weren't using core data syncing either. We were doing the document-based sync, which does work. Um, and we made it work, and it's, but it's still a headache. Uh, I don't know if Dave DeLong's here, is he? Okay, sorry, Dave. Uh, <laughs> I've, I've told some representatives at Apple, they called and asked us specifics about iCloud, and I, I've shared that with them too. Like that, I, I can't say I regret it because when we did iCloud, I mean, a lot of people have their data protected without even knowing it now because they're using iCloud and it's just in the cloud. But we've had a lot of data loss too, which kind of offsets that. That's really hard to deal with. Um, but the week we launched with iCloud, it was given um, Max or App Store iOS app of the week on iPhone and iPad, which was the biggest milestone to date. Like, that was huge. Um, I'll show you a chart of my sales in a minute. So that was another one. And then um, most recently, uh, oh, I had slides for those. The, and, the, and then things like sync, uh, just having sync in the app was really new when I launched it. So like Apple created these, these categories in the app store. This one's called Better Together for apps that sync between iOS and Mac. And that was even before iCloud was out. It was just like, oh, here's apps that are taking advantage of that. Um, and I didn't, ex that, like that category didn't exist. It's just about doing things right and well and they'll notice. Yeah. That was when I was going to talk about iCloud. So most recently, like Mavericks is coming, and uh, the one feature that stood out with Mavericks for me is the map support. So we don't have maps on the iOS app yet, but we've been collecting location GPS data in day one for 
um, over a year. And so, yeah, it's, it's time to like start showing people's data in these, like grouped in on a, on a map with location data. And uh, now we're gonna take advantage of that with the launch of Mavericks and, and release our update that includes a map view, which is really awesome. I'm really excited about this. Um, and I don't know if Apple's going to feature the app when we launch it with Mavericks, but um, there's a good chance it'll get noticed. And we still don't even know when Mavericks is coming. Dave might know. No? No? I think it's around the 20th. It's sometime this month, I would bet. So now you can like click on a node and see all your entries at if if you've you know at the zoo if you've been there ten times you see all your entries from the zoo in one one click there which is pretty cool and you can edit the location on the Mac um, so speaking more about the the design like I think. Um, and just the user experience, like there's lots of little, people that use day one would probably realize it, but people that just see it won't realize like a lot of the work that's gone into every little detail of it. And that's the kind of thing I feel like Apple notices as well. Things like, um, for example, when you add a photo to an entry, we, we check if that photo contains GPS data and if the location, and if the date is different than the current date or off by more than a few hours and will prompt the user, do you want to change your entry to the date of this photo? Uh, would you like to use the location of this photo rather than your current location? Things like that like really make the data more accurate and just enhance the whole experience. And it's not something I really sell people on with it, it's something they just discover when using the app. So it's a journal. I, like people often easily dismiss it because they're like, "Well, I don't, I don't keep a journal." Like, so it's a diary, like for girls or whatever. It's like, that's that's not really how I see it. Like, it's a tool, and I don't have the best memory, uh, like with names and dates and things like that. But I want to be able to retain the details of of my history, my personal history. And it it becomes therapeutic, uh, and it becomes it improves your writing. Like there's so many valuable things by associated with getting things out of your head, writing them down, revisiting your day. Um, yeah, like, and I've just realized a lot of these things by hearing from customers and researching these values, but. Um, it's a tool, and I think we're all tool builders here. And uh, Steve Jobs is one of the best tool builders. He found a way. Um, he knew the potential for computers and tools, and that we could use them to enhance our thinking and our minds. And I really liked this video. Oh. I think one of the, the things that really separates us from the high primates is that uh, yeah. we're tool builders. And I read a, uh, a study that measured the efficiency of locomotion for various species on the planet. The condor used the least energy to move a kilometer. And uh, humans came in uh, with a rather unimpressive showing about a third of the way down the list. It was not, not uh, too proud of a showing for the crown of creation. So. Uh, that didn't look so good, but then somebody in Scientific American had the insight to test the efficiency of locomotion for a man on a bicycle. And a man on a bicycle, or a human on a bicycle, blew the condor away, completely off the top of the charts. And that's what a computer is to me. Uh, what a computer is to me is it's the most remarkable tool that we've ever come up with. And it's the equivalent of a bicycle for our minds. Rest in peace, Steve. So I, I totally connected with that concept of of computers being a tool to enhance our thinking, like in our minds. Um, you know what he refers to as computers is not just hardware; it's the combination of hardware and software working to, together. 
which that's what Apple is so good at. Um, thanks to Steve. So the details um, of an event, like what, or when, where, who, what, how many exact quotes and photos. Um, recently, just, just a little story, a personal story. It's Vampire Weekend, one of my favorite bands. And I was there with my wife and ran into a friend from high school. And she's like, I'm the biggest Vampire Weekend fan. Like, I've seen these guys years ago when they were here in Salt Lake. And I was like, well, I saw them, like, they played Kilby Court in 2007. And she's like, no way. Like, she did not believe me. So I, like, busted out my day one. I was like, this is going to be good. Because I, I had put that, it backdated this entry in there. So that was funny. But things like, um, you know, I want to recommend a sushi roll to somebody that I really enjoyed, and, and a restaurant, or the name of the band that we heard about when we were out somewhere, or details about a visit to the doctor, anything like that. I find, you know, some of those things could be associated with the notes app, but I like the idea of things um, retaining the the location and the exact time that they happened, and it's all searchable, so it's easy for me to recall things like that. So, yeah, stuff like that. It, it, it's a tool for my mind to just, well, so I, I don't have to remember that stuff. I know it's in there. We have a tradition when I uh, go out to a movie with my family, I have three boys, we see all the movies. We take a picture in front of the movie poster and then I'll write about it, give it a rating. This is a promo video. Maybe some of you have seen it. There is a guy who walks up and down the street and he collects bottles and everything, but... The other day I wanted to see what the weather would be like. I went over to my window and I looked up at the sky through the blinds. And then I looked down across the way. So I went to Girl Scout camp every year. It's required that you go out into the wilderness. We were sleeping out near a lake and uh, these squirrels. I put something up on my blog and I saw somebody comment on it. I have your notebook. And I panicked. The only time I ever picked up anybody at a bar, I started to leave the bar, and she's like, why don't you drive? I'm house sitting, there's nobody there. Perfect. He was wearing clothes that were all the same color. Seven giant banana slugs. A D instead of a TH. This German scientist. I was driving a Buick Skyhawk, which is like this big. And, uh, I can't remember. Um, I walked forward on the plane, and baby was still screaming. Parents were both wearing noise-canceling headphones. I remember saying, God, it would suck to lose this. Just as I'm thinking, like, I just gotta get her to pull over, I see red and blue lights. I was like, on the plane, and they wouldn't ask to get off the plane. I just watched my contact lens fly out of my eye. My campmate next to me screamed at the top of her lungs, like a real Dakota fanning scream. And I'd buy a roll filled with, like, cheese and crisps and a chocolate every break, and then again at lunchtime. Oh, he's gone. So we drive around the whole complex, nothing. That freaks me out, because, you know, I'm 10 or 11 years old. And I figured I had three options. I could close the blinds and sell my house. That's why I learned to drive stick. And then I realized I had two pairs of sunglasses on my head. But now I look back, it was definitely binging, And it was, like, the kindest thing that anybody's ever done for me. Moral of the story is don't buy Venetian blinds. So I had Adam Lisa Gore make that video for me. I just gave him, that wasn't my idea. I just said, he liked day one, and I was like, have at it, because um, he's, I admire his work, and yeah, that was kind of fun. In LA, yeah. Adam, Lis Adam Lisagor, um, he's known as Lonely Sandwich, sandwich video. Um, do you guys know who he is? Uh, he's done some awesome promo videos. He's usually, he has a small appearance in this one, but these are just his friends. And, yeah, that was fun. Um, but it's not just a tool for remembering. It's about um, the benefit. It's it's to benefit us and about leaving behind a legacy, leaving behind 
our story to our families and friends. Uh, you know, just think about all the journals that, that are valuable to us today just from historical figures or, or people that we're close to. Um, you know, do you want to be remembered by all of your Twitter status updates or is there more to the story, right? So this is my grandpa, Red Maine, and uh, he died four years ago. But he was, um, he was an engineer. He worked for Chevron, and, um, but he loved computers. Like, he was, he was just that, he was just that way. Like, he kind of just connected with them. Um, you know, he wasn't great at computers, but like, he would love it when I'd come over to his house and just like, anything I could teach him about using his computer. Um, and he, he was always like, he wanted to learn how to do video editing because he wanted to do, create slideshows that he would annotate and do his voiceover and create DVDs to give out to the family. And he, he was on Windows. This was before like Mac was very good at that sort of thing. And it was, I tried to get him going and it was just too hard. And uh, so one day I came over and he had set up this whole contraption with like, he had, he had like a projector like this but it was one of the ones where you can just put a photo on it and it projects it on the wall. And then he had like a record player and he had a video camera just like this set up too, recording what was being projected. And then it was going into a DVD recorder. Then he was just recording it right onto these, burning it right onto a DVD. And then he made these videos. And, and I was like, Grandpa, this is not going to be good quality. And I was like, <laughs> There's such a better way to do this on the computer, but he did it, and because he—that's the way he knew how. He he found a way, and uh, and then uh, this is a little sample of of Grandpa's video. Bear with him, it's just like a minute. Paul Maine's side of the family to the left, and his son Paul Patrick Maine, and his son. Jackson and myself sitting in the chair of four generations. I don't mind showing this picture again. My wife and I. 2007. It was a fun time at Shauna's place. Thank you. I worked for Pan American Airways during the war. They always give me a deferment because they had a Navy contract. I flew in that thing four or five days of the week. The last flight I took was from New York to Miami, and then we flew the ship from, I was a second engineer, from Miami to San Francisco nonstop. During the flight, one of the engines went bad. I fixed it. <laughs> I actually did. You can see in the background, so yeah, Grandpa, he flew planes in the war. He he did. He fixed that engine. Like went out on the on the wing in flight. Stuff like that. Tons of great stories. And while I was there visiting with him all, often, he would share with me, you know, personal stories and just amazing experiences that he had had. And I was like, this is great. I wish I he recorded that stuff or preserved that stuff. And then the next thing I know, he was gone, and I was like, well, what's, what's going to happen to all his stories and, you know, the things he didn't put down in his videos or whatever. And thankfully, like, I was going through his computer, and he, I found these Word docs that he had started writing a manuscript, he called it, of his life, and had written down a lot of these stories he told me. He had these crazy near-death experiences and things that... I felt like I was going to have to go back and like 
either interview my grandma or figure out a way to get these things down so they're preserved for our family history. And uh, thankfully, he did some of that. And, uh, you know, this stuff is priceless now. So um, back to day one, like, uh, when I got it built, I mentioned I was able, like, I... I saved up enough money to hire three friends, like Ben Dolman, he built the Mac app, and then two other guys um, that worked on the iPhone app at the same time, which was kind of a companion. The, the idea was really just about the Mac app, but I was like, well, if we can do an iPhone app and sync with Dropbox, even better, and that worked out really well. But they all had full-time jobs and just gave me fixed bids on the side, so I knew that I could afford at least the 1.0. So here's some of the milestones with day one. Like, it was released on February 27th, 2011. You saw that. iCloud app of the week, I mentioned that. That was 11 months later. Seven months later, we added photos. The number one requested feature was like, please add photos to this. And it took me a while to like, finally commit to that, but I'm glad I did. But I, I added it with a limitation. I was like, one photo per entry. And that's a whole other story about why I've stuck to that. Now the number one cre feature request is multiple photos, um, something I'm hoping to address in 2.0. But uh, there's value in having limitations, too, like not launching it without photos I felt was the best thing for it because it kept that focus on just making the text entry part good. And then with just a single photo, same thing. Like every little element that you add creates a lot of complexity throughout. Um, and then Mac App of the Year was very unexpected because I hadn't, I had really, that whole year of 2012, um, I had focused on the iOS app and making that better. And the Mac App, I felt, was kind of getting a little stale. Now it's been a bigger focus. We've done some big updates to it. And then speaking at Cocoa Slopes. Yes. So um, you can see this, this is revenue. The uh, blue is the, I think the iOS app. Now I'm not so sure. Yeah, that's iOS. The, and the yellow is the Mac. And so you can kind of get an idea, like when it's featured, it's a huge spike, but then it kind of levels off, and you can see we hadn't done any features. This actually only goes till probably four or five months ago, I hadn't updated this, but you know, pretty level, at a great level that keeps it profitable with the team I have. Um, then, and it's always been a paid app. There was one point where Apple invited us to do a back to school promotion, and I made the Mac app half price, so $5 for like three months. And the interesting thing there was this, the actual revenue was almost the same from when it was a $10 app. When it was $5, we sold twice as many, but you know, about had the same amount of revenue. Um, then Apple invited us to the five-year App Store anniversary promotion where they picked five paid apps and five paid games apps to uh, be free for one week. And I didn't really, you know, they called me up and told me, and I didn't really have to think about it. I was like, yeah, we're in. Because, like, there's, first of all, I have the Mac app that's still going to be paid, um, even though I'm giving this away to a, who knows how many people. Um, and, the 1.0 app has been out for a couple of years. Like, we're working towards the 2.0. And so I just thought it'd be an interesting experiment and just to see what happens. We had almost 3 million downloads in one week, which was crazy. Um, you know, on the iOS app, at the time, we've, we had 400,000 paid downloads. So that blew that out. Like, the biggest risk was, like, how much support was going to go up. Like, I have... Um, this sweet lady, she's like 60 years old in Ontario, Canada, that does all our customer support. And she was worried. But things, I've just, I don't know, I'm, I've been super lucky the way things have fallen into place with this. She actually retired from her job 
the day that it went free and was like, of course she had to like, she was then doing this full time for that week. It's since scaled back, but you know, support costs are, and needs have been increased since then. But overall, this, you can see the, the yellow one is iOS. So you can see where it was free. We have no um, revenue from that. But during that promotion period, the Mac app was selling like four times normal. And then since the promotion, like the, uh, our average sales have been up on both platforms. So that turned out to be a great opportunity. So uh, it makes money. Like uh, when it was just me for the first year and a half, like um, I was making really good money. And it's like, um, you know, what am I going to do? Or just retire? Like I'm doing, I have my dream job. I love this product and I just want to make it better. It's not about just making more money. Um, you know, what the money did do is it gave me freedom to like um, make the decisions about the future of the product and, and also the lifestyle. Like I work from home and, and I want to maintain that. Like I, I love working from home. This was a poster I got at Facebook when I visited there. It says, we don't build services to make money. We make money to build better services. Um, they may or may not be true to that, but I like, to, I like that concept. Um, yeah, so the freedom, uh, I get to work on this product all the time that I'm super passionate about. Um, I get to work with the people that I admire. And most important, I get to spend time with my family. So I have a wife and four kids. Um, working from home is an awesome blessing to spend more time with them and catch more moments of their lives. So this is my office in the basement and um, those are my boys. I'm showing them a YouTube video over breakfast. Uh, so yeah, using the contractors like was great and the, after the first year and a half, I had no intentions of like hiring anyone full, full time. I was like, yeah, I can just make this work ongoing, you know, it, it, everything's fine. And then, and then it, it took me a while, but I realized there's a lot more to day one long term that I want to achieve and to do so like I need full time help. So um, I tried to recruit Andrew, he wouldn't, he wouldn't do it. So. <laughs> I get, Andrew helped me out on day one too. Um, uh, but um, I got Ben Dolman, the original guy that built the Mac app and a longtime friend of mine. Um, it took a while, but yeah, I convinced him to leave Mosey and work for me, um, build day one, and he loves it. And I consider him a partner on it. He definitely has like um, a vested share in the company too. Um, I liked this. If you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And I want to take day one as far as I can. Like I'm not just in it to like sell off quickly or um, you know have a perceived value. Like I feel like there's a lot more that this product can achieve. And so over the past year, it's been crazy. Like, but and I never thought this would happen. But I have six full-time employees, including myself, and two part-time. And uh, you know, four of these guys are some of the best engineers I've ever worked with. Um, and then that's Shelly, our support lady. And then this is Dallas, my uh, my manager friend that I just hired recently. Um, you know, over the past year, my job changed significantly as I brought these guys on. Um, it wasn't just about building a product with like one or two guys. I became a manager, like managing the team and each of their tasks, making sure everybody has their stuff going, something I'd never done before. Um, but, and not something that I typically enjoy, but I was willing to just do it because it's making my product move forward. But I, you know, and this is us working, we, we get together at my house occasionally. Um, but I quickly uh, 
realized that like the design side of things was like lacking and so I've like brought in some other designers to help me out and I, I was like I don't want to let go of the design stuff I want to focus on that so it was either hire another designer or find somebody to do more of the management stuff and that's when I convinced another friend of mine Dallas to join the team and you know it's good when you can hire one of your best friends to to work for you and he's one of the most qualified guys for the job um, one of the most common questions is, what's the next app, bro? <laughs> and uh, it's day one. Like, I, ideas are not hard to come by. I, we all have app ideas. I hear app ideas from people in my neighborhood all the time. And uh, there's good ones, too. There's ideas I know that could, could be executed and, and successful. Um, yeah, yeah, and sometimes it, it's hard because I'm like, I know we could build this app and it would be a hit and it wouldn't be that hard, but any distraction from what we're doing on day one takes away from what we want to achieve. And so the focus there is huge. And I, I feel like that's been a big part of the longer term success that we're seeing is just focusing on this product and core elements of it. Um, uh, let's see, I won't. There's, there's a page on the site about lots of uses. I'm not going to go into that. Some of our tools um, that we use to collaborate, all my team works from home. We're all remote. And I did have one guy full time that was located in the UK. And he was great. And the time thing, difference thing wasn't too big of an issue. But there were other issues that came up. And I decided, you know, I'm going to try. And even though we don't have a space where we're together all the time, I'm going to try and make sure everybody's at least in Utah, if possible, except for Shelly. Um, so all the current team is all very close together. I'm in Harriman, and they're in Utah County nearby. Um, we use HipChat to, it's, it's like we talk all day in chat rooms. I feel like we're together all day. Um, and you know, video conference maybe do once a week uh, with the team, and then screen sharing. That's important, especially where I'm doing UI design. Like, I'll work closely with a developer, and we're both controlling my screen using the Messages app. That's pretty slick. And then GitHub is a huge part of our workflow, um, as well as our we have a build server on Mac Mini Colo. There's been Dolan, Dolman making an O face. <laughs> um, so GitHub, you guys are all familiar with GitHub, but like for code and organization, collaboration, tasks and bug tracking and stuff, there's lots of um, tools out there for like product and team um, uh, management stuff. And GitHub doesn't solve all those issues. There's no like prioritization methods or anything, but we really like keeping things light, and we've made it work just with GitHub. Um, uh, Facebook, there's a story there. I've had several um, companies invite me out or talk to me about acquisition type stuff. I made some, some relationships with some higher up Facebook people, and they've invi they invited me out. This was before we even launched Photos, so it's a while back. Um, trying to acquire day one. Wanted me to come out, meet with Mark Zuckerberg, and I was like, okay, free trip to meet Mark. Like, I'll, I'll come out, but there was no chance. Um, because why would I sell something that, like, I'm passionate about, I love, it's successful, and there's so much more that's just coming that uh, will increase the value of it. Um, so what's next? We're working on our iOS 7 update. I showed you the Maps one from uh, Mavericks that's coming. But we're, uh, we have Jason Webb, who is our, our server guy. We're doing lots of web service related things um, in 2.0 with importing and sharing. We've also partnered with a book printing company so people can order books right through the app uh, of a printed version, bound version of their journal, which is really cool. Um, most importantly, just to keep building cool stuff on my own terms. Um, this is a Pika 2.0 app. Um, 
some inspirations, like I mentioned a little bit about the data and um, infographics, telling a story just through this data. And so with day one, we collect lots of, lots of data, and we don't really present it in meaningful ways yet. Uh, but eventually, we're going to get there. I'm a huge fan of Nicholas Felton, who creates these um, annual reports of his life. He tracks so many little details. And you read these annual reports, it, it's just these graphs that have little um, keys and, and charts and stuff. But you can just totally tell like what his life is like and who he is just by looking at these graphs. It just tells the story so well. And for me, like this, this box of ticket stubs that I've like kept for my whole life is a big inspiration to me because I like um, each one of those has a memory associated with it, along with a date and a, a location and an event. And those are things that um, that I feel like I want to elaborate on and add to my journal at some point. And I never have. Like this box still just sits there. Eventually, those are all going to be inside day one and complete my life timeline in a way. So it's about passion. Like you can always find your way and make ideas happen if you're passionate about it. And uh, we can't rely on following others how they've found success. You have to find a way that works for us individually, like playing off our own strengths and making smart decisions that will work in whatever the market is at that time. And uh, yeah, I think I'm out of time. So I thank you guys. Yeah, like that's a concern. Like just just the way the App Store model works, they don't have an upgrade path. Like it's like, and people are finding ways or figuring out ways to make it work, whether it's like an in-app purchase or or what. Um, yeah, that's a constant concern. Not so much about the future of the product. Like I just want to make the pro like, make the product continually get better. But I ha in order to do so, it has to be profitable. So yeah, figuring out how we're gonna release 2.0 and if it's a new a new app that you have to repurchase or or what we still have those discussions every day now yeah, that's just something you have to figure out it's not cut and dry uh, yeah for existing users I, I i think the people that use it want to continue to pay for it like they they know the val like it's more valuable to them than just $15 so yeah it was it was the simplicity of it um, none of them did plain text even um, it was on Mac and iOS there were no journal apps that did sync between Mac and iOS so yeah, I think Mac is actually a good opportunity. Like a lot of people think, well, the market share on iOS is so huge, like I should target that first. Well, the Mac app space is less crowded. Like I feel like that's a good place to start. That's where I started. Um, so the sync, the design, I think that's what kind of stood out. 